so yes, uh, the title of this talk is called Webpack for the State of the Art. So I remember uh, I have spoken here before, and so I really appreciate uh, being invited back to speak again. Um, but So for all who are new here, um, or I haven't seen before, who knows what Webpack is? Okay, okay. Who uses Webpack? Cool. Cool. Who knows how it works? There's nothing to be ashamed of if you don't know. Um, who uses like Grunt or Gulp? Who uses Make? I tried that for the first time. Don't look at my Twitter if you're a fan of Make. Um, <laughs> so yes, my name is Sean Larkin. Um, I'm a program manager at Microsoft uh, working on Edge Dev tools specifically for the web platform. Um, but you might know me as a maintainer of an open source project called Webpack. Um, I'm also formerly a uh, core team member of the Angular CLI. Where's our Angular folks at? Woo woo, Angular. Okay, yeah. Um, and then also just an evangelist for general open source sustainability. Um, and I, I'm serving on the, uh, uh, on the modules group in the Web WebAssembly community group and representing not only Webpack, but all of your user interests there as well. <clears throat> so a little bit about myself. Um, I started out as a former tech support rep gone rogue. I got tired of not being able to solve people's problems. It was frustrating. I wanted to actually fix the problems. Um, and so I started teaching myself to program, learned Ruby, and then Objective-C, and Swift, and then eventually JavaScript. I think my first language was AppleScript. Who, like, wrote AppleScript? Yeah, like, that was my first language. Um, so yeah, sustainable open source practices is a huge passion of mine. And you might hear about that a little bit today as well. So. You can find me on like any of the mediums you see here below, like at the Larkin if you wanted to tweet that. That's fine. You upgrade to Webpack 4. Good game, too easy. Um, so go ahead and do so. But really, we're going to be talking about Webpack 4, the state of the art. And what does that mean? Um, the state of the art. The state of the art itself. So, you know, I, I kind of I did some soul searching. I was like, what is this? Like, can I really put this title up here? Um, so, you know, the most recent stage of development. Um, almost avant-garde? I don't think we're avant-garde. But bleeding edge? Futuristic? Maybe. Um, and so you may have known not no more than, what, how many days has that been? Like, no more than a month ago, we released Webpack 4 officially. But what you might not have known is that we have a code name for it called Legato. Um, and so, I guess the first thing is like, why did why did you guys call it Webpack Legato? Um, and so, to def who's a, who is a music graduate? Yeah, same here, same here. Um, so Legato means to play notes in a flowing manner without gaps, so connected together. Um, and this was a title given by our major sponsor, Travago. Uh, this, this time, and we're going to be doing this for every single major release that we have, is that we wanted to provide our largest sponsor the opportunity to name the build and the release and what it means to them. Um, and so Travago, who uh, not only um, you know, is our largest sponsor, but uh, colleagues of ours, you know, we reached out and we said, hey, can, would you like to name it? And so this was the description they said. They said, Travago, we usually give our project names uh, with a musical theme. And so... For example, we use a JS framework called Harmony. And our new framework is called Melody. On the PHP side, we use Symphony and you know, that with a top layer called Orchestra. And so you know, Webpack bundles our front end app together without gaps. The JavaScript, the CSS, all of the assets. And so we believe that Legato is a great fit for Webpack. Um, and we, we couldn't agree more ourselves. Um, but like, just like Trivago, like, if you see, if anybody here works for any of these companies, like just take a look for a second, and you can raise your hand. You know, if any of you works for any of them, or is one of these people right here? <laughs> are you one of those people? I know it's hard to see, but if you are, raise your hand, and then let, I mean, like, a round of applause, because nothing would be possible without the kind of support that we've had for our open source project. This month alone, we have offered $32,000 to be, that has been expensed already for the month of February that's given back to our contributors for working on our project. 
And this is the largest contributor base that we've had to date, beating January, where we had 1,000 individual contributors on Webpack, or our ecosystem of plugins and loaders. So what does Webpack 4 mean? Like, what did it mean to us, and how does it relate to what we you know, think you were looking, uh, looking out of it? And so we separated it into three concepts. One was smaller and faster builds. And then the second one was modernization. And then finally, I think, last but nowhere least, is developer experience. So like, to just break down even smaller and faster builds, you kind of have to create this tree, where if you want to have smaller builds, you kind of have to do a deeper analysis and remove more code and process more of the module graph. But to have like faster builds, you have to do less work and reuse work that's already been done. So you can see here we're kind of um, given a really complex challenge here. How are we going to solve something like this? And we'll go back to that. <laughs> but keep that in your mind. So we started by just adding a bunch of features um, and optimizations, not only from upstream uh, repositories like Uglify ES and adding parallel and caching, um, but we also rebuilt APIs that uh, were internal, like our chunk graph. Um, in addition to moving a lot of the nat native objects and arrays that we used to have and converting them to maps and sets for ES6 support. And then probably one of the most important things that we did for uh, build speed optimization is actually we completely rewrote the plugin system from the ground up. Um, and so the reason behind it uh, is the plugin system that we had today, if you take a look here, this is an example of one of those methods in the library called tappable. And so you can think of this like event emitter where these methods are extended to an object and they can call them and uh, pass a string as the event and a bunch of plugins can listen and perform functionality based upon them. But the problem here is that it can take an unlimited amount of arguments and then you know though that data is passed through to the plugins, but it's, this is really poor for the V8 engine to optimize. Um, and we call this polymorphism. So we thought to ourselves, like, what could we do? Like, could we make this faster? Um, and so like in Webpack 3, we kind of played around with this, where we would take and we'd define the same function three times, but like each one would take X amount of parameters. But by the end of it, we would have had like thousands of different methods in the single library. Um, so not only is it unmaintainable, um, super bug prone, uh, but also just, you know, it's more code that's really not needed. So no. Um, so what we decided to do is we use a technique which we call lazy compiling. Um, and all this means is we shove, we basically concatenate a bunch of generated function calls and pass those strict amount of arguments into these compiled, aka evaluated new function uh, JavaScript files or, or JavaScript code. And so what this ensures though is that we basically look and say, well, how many plugins are applied to this? What are the arguments that are passing through to it? And what are the interceptors? And is it asynchronous or sync? Based on those exact conditions, we'll generate a very unique type of function. And so therefore, that function has a fixed set of parameters, and so it's monomorphic. So I won't get too much more into this, but if you wanted to learn more about like why is this powerful and why is this great, um, Please take a look at, you can go to the aka.ms link here, um, but Yacheslav uh, Egorov wrote an article about, you know, what is, what's up with this monomorphism? Um, and then maybe you saw this article, like not too, or this blog post not too long ago, saying we don't really need Rust, um, where essentially he, descri <laughs> he describes that you can take and evaluate a new function to lazy compile uh, some sort of templated code. And so this is exactly the same implementation. So if you want it in an easier to read format, you can see it. However, just as V8 Senpai teaches me from uh, the V8 team, do, don't use this in your normal user lane code. This is specifically just insight on how did we make Webpack as fast as it was for V4. And unless you have function calls like we do in Webpack that get executed on large builds nine billion times, you don't need this. 
So like, what's, what's the magic number? Sean, I, I don't really care, I wanna see numbers. So Webpack in its upper bounds is 98% faster. 98% faster builds from Webpack 3 to Webpack 4. And if you don't believe me, <laughs> I even have the issue here that, that showcases it. We were seeing some builds were taking, uh, well, like for very scaled users, nine hours. Nine hour build. Now, mind you, this, they, they canceled it at six, but we found out it was a nine hour build. But we were able to reduce it to 17 minutes um, with these optimizations. Yeah, and then like the classic uh, Sokra, who's the original author of Webpack, I have an idea, which always concerns me, but it turned out pretty well here. <laughs> I have an idea. <laughs> it's gonna involve magic. Um, so like I wasn't quite sold on this number yet. 98%, it's kind of a, that's crazy. How can we advertise that? So I instead, just while we released our beta client, we said, can you upgrade to V4? We'd be willing to help. We'll hold your hand throughout the process. Just tweet us some before and after build stats. So we were seeing things like 75%, 80%. Again, 90%. And that's not even talking about when you run it again, which is uh, a warm cache, which we've added for Aglify.js. So um, the results blew us away. They literally blew us away. So um, now let's go to the other side, <laughs> which is smaller builds. We've talked about doing less work, but how do we do, how do we analyze more of the graph? So one of the, one of the first things that we wanted to add um, for making your build smaller. Who here like uses Webpack but like imports a JSON file? Like I've ever done that before? Did you know that like you get the whole file even if you only use a couple data points, right? So this specifically drove that feature where you can see this example here, we added JSON tree shaking. We can treat JSON just like an ECMAScript module. JSON is just a strict set of what JavaScript capabilities are. And so therefore, if I only import one piece, I think you can see it right here, it's only actually gonna include that export inside your code. So you instantly, if you're doing code like this today and you, up, you update to Webpack 4, you're gonna see significant build, build, side, or build size reductions. Um, and then there's another, uh, I guess I'll paint the story. So probably one of the most challenging or um, challenging parts about implementing the uh, ES modules is the fact that inside of the specification it says, whenever you have more than one export re-exported to another file, every export, regardless of its, if it's used or not, has to be evaluated in the case that they affect each other or create side effects. So like in this case right here, you're exporting an A, B, and C from individual files. Even if they don't touch each other or like modify each other, according to the spec, browsers actually have to ship and evaluate and parse all of this code. However, and you can see that here, all of it's included, even if you only use one export. Um, and so what we decided was like, well, what if, I mean, if we know that they're not being touched, then we could just remove them. Because if they don't affect the other exports, then they don't need to be evaluated. So we created a feature called side effects. Um, and I know side effects mean something different in functional programming. But in this case, we're saying that this is a flag that a package author can add to their package.json that says, any exported uh, values do not affect each other, or do not cause side effects against each other. And because of that, then we can prune them out. So. Not only does it let us do less work, but it removes more code. Um, and who uses Lodash here? You know, by, by our coworker, or Brendan and, and uh, Sarah and I work with JD Dalton. Um, and so we had him pilot this first because it's a great example. There's maybe 200 plus exports in a single file. And so when you were using Webpack 3, it's 223 kilobytes, even if you only use one function. So uh, what I wanted to do before Webpack 4 landed, I, I landed the side effects false feature in. 
And as you can see, the result, three kilobytes. So um, those who use Lodash, uh, Lodash-ES, and you're using Webpack 3, look forward to some incredibly rewarding uh, upgrade experience uh, once you upgrade to Webpack 4. So like, you know, overall, it's like to get these smaller builds, you know, all you have to do as a developer is you got to tree shake and mangle these exports and scope hoist and minimize, and then you can package authors just need to set side effects. Easy enough. No, that's ridiculous. Are you kidding me? You just need to run Webpack. You just need to run Webpack. That's the whole point. And that kind of goes into developer experience. Like, we, we saw that there is a huge demand for, we want better defaults. We want a better way to know, like, we want a production environment. And so, like, you can even see here in this example that Webpack isn't running without a config. And you're getting all those things that I just stated. So, you know, we, we define developer experience to us as having a lower a barrier to entry, better defaults, and the term that we coined, which is zero CJS, so zero config JS. Um, and, you know, uh, who has tried Parcel before? I've tried Parcel. It sounds almost too good to be true, right? Like, you're like, what? Especially if they use your magic stack. Um, and so, like, they taught us that really a zero config is, is a value proposition that people like. And so it's like, well, let's do it. Why not? Um, but we're going to take a different approach for the future on what zero config means. It doesn't mean to tell us, it doesn't mean letting you do whatever you want without ever touching a config. That's wrong. And, you know, there's some, I'll just say that the aforementioned library has a lot of resulting issues. And think, if you were using, if a library has SAS, Stylus, Less, Preact, Reason, what else is, is built into it? And one thing breaks and you don't even use it. That's a breaking change. So we fundamentally disagree with this model. However, we really believe in zero config. And we really believe that zero config means that you get to define what it means. And you can extend the, the zero config experience that we build for you. <coughs> and on top of that, and, and this is really just powered by mode, like our mode property. So we have a production mode and a development mode. And by creating these, we were able to remove 90% of the plugins that people use. And so you don't need a config. Um, so in mode development, what, what we focused on is tooling that allows for browser debugging. So you get a really fast source map and it allows you to have fast incremental compilation. And user uh, and like error messages that are useful. If you even look inside your source code, you'll see paths in the module wrappers, things that actually make sense for a developer. And then in production, it's all those things I talked about before. Small output size, fast code at runtime, Omitting development-only code, like getting rid of it. Um, who has ever had to do define plugin and then pass the production env variable? We're doing that out of the box. If you just run Webpack without a config and you try to bundle React, it it drops all of that for you. You never have to set that plugin. Not exposing source code or file paths, um, and then just easy to output assets. And then, like my favorite, <laughs> which is destroying the common chunk plugin. So we got rid of it. Um, we really found out that people were trying to, oh, well, okay, so from my perspective is that um, we had so many people asking for help on synthetically modifying this common chunk plugin to do these things when really they had much more uh, at scale problems that, you know, that they need to focus on, like shipping less JavaScript or, um, not having better asynchronous caching. And so by default now, Commons Chunk Plugin, we, re we replaced it with a plugin that just works out of the box. So what are you getting now when you use mode production? We automatically will cache anything and create separate bundles for you based on file size rather than trying to define some ar arbitrary libraries. 
Um, so it's a real heuristic that actually reflects performance that you don't have to worry about. Um, and then one of, like, one of my favorite features, because I got to pair with Sam Ciccone, uh, uh from Google on, is, oh, I guess, Paul, I, Paul, are you hiding back there still? Paul Irish, I, I believe you even helped hack on this a little bit. But um, So this allows you to, uh, so we added a plugin called the, the profiling plugin. So if you add this to your configuration, it's going to spit out a JSON stream. And you can paste this into the Chrome DevTools timeline viewer. And you can actually see a breakdown per plugin what is taking the longest to run. So this, this comes with v4 out of the box. And here's a cool visualization for it. Literally every single one of these, these lines up here are, are individual plugins that are executing. And so this gives us as a library, or this gives library authors the ability to be able to say like, oh, this is actually causing a problem in the hot path. Or, oh, there's a problem here. Why is this taking so long? Or it helps us as maintainers be able to identify like what's, what is the slow code that's shipping? And there's just a, a zoomed in version. Um, and so like the last piece, uh, which I think is like it's important for the future because it really paves the way for everything we're doing. So modernization and re-architecture. Um, so who has tried WebAssembly yet? Have you ever had to handwrite WebAssembly? Okay, have you done the, the, the runtime code yourself? Um, it's kind of tedious. Um, and we saw a huge value for this and so did Mozilla when they, when they uh, accepted our grant you know, for $125,000 a year ago to implement this as a first class citizen. Um, and so Webpack 4 has uh, the experimental WebAssembly support out of the box. Um, you don't have to configure anything, you just uh, import a WebAssembly module and you'll be able to actually use it just like a JavaScript module. Um, but it also forced us to remove a bunch of hacks that were in our library that allowed us to um, make, I guess, abstract away the JavaScript specifics from our system. So now, what does this mean? We're going to see in upcoming versions of Webpack, HTML, CSS become first class citizens. Or even really cool things like loaders that take a native language and compile it to a WebAssembly module. And since Webpack handles a WebAssembly module, you can do crazy things like this, like, Walt, so this is just a, a new language that um, has been kind of surfacing in the ecosystem. It looks just like TypeScript, right? But with like Rust types. This compiles to WebAssembly. And you can just import it and then use it like a WebAssembly module. Or I'm sorry, use it like a JavaScript module because we take care of all of that behind the scenes. Um, and then a couple other things that really helped us was dropping Node for support. So if you're using Webpack 4, you're going to have to upgrade to Node 6. Sorry, not sorry. And then, <laughs> um, but this let us do things like convert the rest of our code to ES6. Uh, it let us remove slow and hard to read and hard to contribute code paths. And it allowed us to ship code that's optimized for V8 to be fast. And I mean, like, I'd be here for two hours if I was going through every single change. So like, we have a lot of great changes that we've added, small features, asks and contributions from individual people and companies who have needs for these things. Um, so I, I encourage you to take a look at the change log. And so like I said, this is you know smaller, smaller and faster builds, modernization and developer experience. Um, and so how, Sean, how do I migrate? Well, so that, this was actually one of the, probably the most contentious parts about our release is that we, and I'll talk about that in a second, but we have the PR for our migration our migration guide up right now. So if you go to our docs repo, you can literally see it. If you wanted to go by that, we're just waiting to reorganize it into a different folder into our docs. Um, you can go to our plugin or our, our medium publication and you can take a look and see kind of the overview top level. Um, and if you have custom plugins, reach out to us. Or if you're using a custom plugin that you don't maintain, ask the maintainer, like, how can I help? Um, and so one of the things that we focused on was prioritizing support to work with all the major frameworks um, and make sure that they were unblocked first. But to do that, we kind of sacrificed the time that we spent um, ensuring that documentation and everything else was lined up. And we figured that 
maybe we can make more of an impact across all of our users' ecosystems by fixing the built-in framework tools first. Um, and also, if you want to like hang out and contribute or learn how to contribute to Webpack, you can go my Twitch stream, self-promotion, whatever. Um, but literally, like uh, I think I stream every Monday and Thursday nights at 9:30 Pacific time. Um, but we literally go through and we'll update plugins live. I think I did a live coding with uh, one of the engineers from Airbnb, who is one of our sponsors. But we learned how to upgrade a Resolver plugin, you know, from V3 to V4. And so, um, who here watches my stream? Ubi, where are you? Yeah, there he is. A, a, a very faithful follower. Oh, yeah, both. Um, <laughs> um, and so you might be like, is four really production ready, Sean? Um, so before we decided to actually ship the final, we wanted to make sure that it works in-house at Microsoft. And so um, Ken Shaw, he, I don't think he knew he was going to be in this presentation, but um, he's an engineer, one of the lead engineers on the Outlook web app team who uses Microsoft Outlook. Yeah, OK. Um, and so not only did they see their inner dev loop like cut in half by you know a, a fifth, um, but they also saw their code considerably reduced by 20, 22 kilobytes. Um, <laughs> and so that's live right now, shipping Webpack. It's being built with Webpack 4 in production. Um, so what's next? And I'll kind of blaze through it since I've been talking for a bit. So CSS, HTML, URL as module type. That means beautiful things like get rid of the extract text plugin. You technically might not even need any of the CSS URL file loaders. You could get HTML as an entry point. And things that we actually have added since I even did this, this slide deck, which is we added a plugin called Mini Extract or Mini CSS Extract plugin, which allows you to code split your CSS. Um, and then we'll do the web packing WASM part two. So we'll move it from experimental to stable. We'll um, basically where WASM modules, they've been structured and designed exactly like ES modules. So that means we could tree shake them, we could dead code eliminate them, we could scope hoist them. Things that like the standards bodies were like, wait, you could do that? I'm like, yes, we can. It's just like JavaScript. Um, and then what's important to me is our preset system. Uh, like I said, extending the zero CJS or zero config JS. What if it was as easy as just installing a preset called Webpack Can Use TypeScript? How cool would that be? And you instantly do nothing but just use TypeScript and profit. So we really, really, really believe in something like this. This is just a um, kind of a design mock, but um, I really believe in something like this. And these presets can be built of smaller blocks that we make for you, um, like resolving TypeScript, loading TypeScript. Um, and then finally, what's, what's after? What's the next major change going to have for us? So two things, um, fully persistent disk caching. So like, we don't even have that right now. That's one of the key features of Parcel is that they're like, yeah, we, we have full disk caching. Um, so now that we're even to, to speed parity with them, uh, we haven't even implemented these things yet. And so the um, room to grow is huge. And then adding multi-core support or multi-threading for builds. And then moving our exper experimental module types to stable. And then probably a really cool one is like bring your own module type. What if you could define TypeScript as a module type? And as Webpack traces that file and parses it, it extracts all the type information out and uses it for smaller, more powerful optimizations. That you could create the module type for it. Like, I see a dream where people say, I want to use TypeScript to make my apps smaller. So, but in the end, it's up to you guys. You, you all have the choice to vote on whatever we should be working on. So go to webpack.js.org slash vote. And um, you know, like I said, we're going to focus on the next major release to actually have a migration guide in our docs as a major dependency before we ship. Uh, but otherwise, you know, like oh, I try and say this all the time, and if you follow me on Twitter, you know this, is that like we're we're treating this year 2018 and the, the amount of progress that we see in JavaScript every day as a renaissance. We we don't we don't see this as a fatigue, and that's just a mindset. It's, it's a static mindset. You can choose to embrace it and grow with how, like, what language today lets you use syntax that doesn't actually exist in production? None, and, and Java VMs don't count. Um, 
So like, how amazing is that? Why do you think that it's not churn, it's, it's this like evolution, precambian evolution that's just incredible. And so I want you to walk away thinking about that and how you know, the next thing that you might see today could bring a huge amount of innovation. And you know, we think at Webpack that you know, we're, we wanna be right near the center um, and pivot no matter which way it goes. So try it today. And um, by all means, you can reach out to me on Twitter, uh, at the Lark Inn, or hashtag Webpack. We even have an at Webpack Twitter now, so I'm watching that as well. So thank you guys.